try to do as much good possible as efficiently as possible. And that efficiency thing is really fun if you guys who are listening are out for a challenge. Like one of the things that you can, I think this heightens the meaning in your life is to try to do difficult things, right? Aim high. Don't aim so damn high you can't manage it and make sure you break down your aims into reasonably attainable sub goals, but you want to aim high and then you want to see how hyper efficient you can get. That's a great thing to do in your early 20s is to see, okay, like discipline yourself. You think, okay, how much work can I do if I load myself right to the maximum? How far do I, how far can I work? How hard can I work until I exhaust myself? And then you back off obviously because the optimal amount of working productive engagement let's say is that which is sustainable across decades so you have to you have to learn that but you don't learn that without stretching yourself to your limits to begin with and you know if your life isn't everything it could be and if you're suffering from an excess of meaninglessness well it means you're not oriented in the world of chaos and order properly it's like you could learn to discipline yourself look figure out what figure out what it is that you need to do and that you want to do and then see how efficient you can get because one of the things that's quite fun is to figure out if you have a task, I always tell my graduate students this if they're doing an experiment too, if you have a task that you have to do, it's really interesting to spend a few minutes, sometimes hours, depending on how long the task is, see if you can figure out how to do it from, from five to ten times faster. It means you'll have to rearrange the way you think about it, but you can often do it. And that's how extremely productive people get so hyper efficient. You know, sometimes it means you have to delegate. It means sometimes it means you have to bring other people aboard. That's delegation as well, I suppose. Um, but there's a lot of preconceptions that you hold about who you are and who the world is that you could dispense with that would make you a way more efficient actor in the world. Ask yourself what would motivate you. You know, first of all, don't be studying eight hours a day because that isn't going to work and you're not going to do it anyways. You know, would you start studying five minutes a day? Seriously, would you, could you bring it up to 10 minutes a day? What would you have to do for yourself to get yourself to sit down for half an hour a day and, and study intently? Like maybe you'd have to, I don't know, what you'd have to do? Like have a beer at six o'clock at night or something, or maybe you'd have to go for a walk in the park or go out for coffee. It's like, imagine that you're sitting down with a stupid, undisciplined child who, and you're trying to get that child to do something useful. And you say, okay, look, I want you to do X, it's necessary, but you can pick how much of it you're going to do and I'll give you what you want if you do it. Well, ask yourself that and see what happens. So don't try to tyrannize yourself, you know, try to negotiate with yourself and use some reward and see how that works. And start slow, you know, maybe, maybe you're not very disciplined and the best you can do is half an hour of studying it a day. Well, start with half an hour, increase that five minutes a week. You know, if you do that, that's a lot. If you if you do that for a year, then you'll by the end of the year you'll be studying four hours a day. So you can that's that's just with five that's just with five minutes a week, right? Because that's 250 minutes in a year. So start ridiculously pathetically. Um, study for five minutes a day for a week, and then move it to ten. You'll be able to do that. And don't cheat, you know, because one of the things people do is they make a deal with themselves like that. I'm, all, I'm going to study for 10 minutes a day, each day. And then they, they get into it and they think, wow, this is going really good. So they study for two hours and then they've broken the contract with themselves and they don't trust themselves anymore. And then they don't study for a whole year or, well, maybe not, for a month. So, but set your contract. Ask yourself, you know, what could I do to move myself forward to my goal? that I would do, and then how could I improve that incrementally? You can't exist outside of a framework of value. It's not possible. It's not technically possible. I outline this in, in quite, quite a bit of detail in chapter 10, which is called rule 10, which is called be, be precise in your speech, is that the way the world manifests itself to you is integrally tied to your value structure. And that's because to put it very simply is that your very vision is dependent on an aim like whenever you look at the world you're aiming at something you're aiming at something with your eyes you you can't focus on something without mm -hmm. aiming at it and you won't aim at it without valuing it so your very perceptions are dependent on your value structure now that doesn't mean there isn't a world it means that it does mean that experience is a complex interplay of your value structure and and the unmanifest world it's something like that 
And then that begs the question, which is, well, if you have to have a value structure, then what should it be? Well, and then that brings us back to the ideas that we were talking about earlier. Like, you, you, you should, you should value being. You should take on the responsibility of being as your highest ethical obligation, and try to improve it. Try to reduce suffering. Try to try to make the most out of yourself in a way that's beneficial to you and your family and your community. You should aim high, and your perceptions will reconfigure themselves around those aims, and that will allow the world to manifest itself to you in the most positive possible manner, that, or at least in the most meaningful pos possible manner. And in the absence of that, all you have is stupid suffering. That is, that is the anxiety and depression that we talked about earlier. Without a point, without value, without an aim, all you're left with is the misery and anxiety of life. That makes people bitter. I love the even the note to, to bring up the notion of the aim because there are one can react to this stupid suffering <laughs> in a number of ways. But this is so clear. You write in it. You say uh, you, you cannot aim yourself at anything if you are completely undisciplined and untutored. Mm -hmm. You will not know what to target. You won't fly straight even if you do get your aim right. And and. Then you will conclude there is nothing to aim for, and then you will be lost. And, and these days, the prevailing moral framework, as I see it, is if it feels good, do it. Uh, how is it that discipline and the straight and narrow offer the best chance for a good life? And, and well, uh, how is it that we have forgotten yep. th that is the case? Well, the reason that discipline is necessary is because you're a... of competing short-term interests and so the question is then well which short-term interests should win out and the answer to that is well none of them they need to be organized into a hierarchy that makes them functional across time and across individuals so like a two-year-old is very likely to act out his or her proximal impulse but of course a two-year-old can't survive in the world you have to regulate you have to bring your your primary instincts, let's say, under the regulatory structure of a higher order value system that allows them to manifest themselves without undue mutual sacrifice across large spans of time in the presence of large numbers of other people. So that requires a very sophisticated ordering. It's like we already talked about the fact that a meta narrative is necessary to unite subcultures, say so that they can operate peacefully and harmoniously within the same space. The same thing applies within you, because you're like an, you're an internal coalition of warring single-minded tribes, and they have to all be brought under the organizational structure of long-term collective vision, let's say. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to be disciplined. And any discipline, speaking, you know, technically speaking, is an attempt to bring all those competing short-term impulses under a large, a larger scale and more inclusive framework. And so you do that and then, well, that's actually what gives you freedom. Being impulsive and being free aren't the same things because if you're impulsive, you're just the slave of your impulses. Right. There's no freedom in that, That's that's just, that's the same freedom, so to speak, literally, that a two-year-old has because a two-year-old isn't socialized yet. So it's not...
it's a completely it, it that doesn't function in this in the sophisticated world it doesn't work right everyone knows it we just like to pretend sometimes and say oh that does feel good you know now i, I have one well, last we like to pretend all the time because yeah. That's why we go out and drink, you know, because drinking enables you to blind yourself to the long-term consequences of your actions. And there's no doubt that that's very, very rewarding in the short term. But it's also why you wake up the next morning hungover and ashamed. 